Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous and I mean over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. I'm sitting in one of my favorite places on this collapsing planet and that is by the banks of Fish Eating Creek in southeast Florida. Do yourself the favor and come down to Fish Eating Creek some point in your life. But before I head back to civilization and reality uh, here on this spectacularly gorgeous, where are we? Thursday, February 4th, 2021. Just need to do what I try to do when I'm not out in the wilderness, and that's bringing you news of the collapsing planet. Uh, <clears throat> several of you alert listeners have sent me this excellent book-length article from The Atlantic uh, by uh, journalist Peter Brannon. And this, is, this thing takes well over an hour to read at full speed so I'm just going to read we're gonna read the opening and the closing so a little bit of a spoiler alert I'm gonna give the ending we're gonna read the first few paragraphs and the last few paragraphs and I highly suggest you go on to the link and read this excellent excellent article for yourself anyone trying to figure out what this planet could very well look like uh, as the collapse of this version of the planet moves into high gear. So uh, take it away, Peter Brannon in The Atlantic in this long essay titled The Terrifying Warning Lurking in the Earth's Ancient Rock Record. Our climate models could be missing something big Yes, they could be, and uh, they're talking about the weathering of rocks, uh, just so you know, but uh, as I say, guys, uh, let's just do the beginning and the end, starting out. <clears throat> we live on a wild planet a wobbly, erupting, ocean-sloshed orb that careens around a giant thermonuclear explosion in the void. But big rocks whiz by overhead, and here on the Earth's surface, whole continents crash together, rip apart, and occasionally turn inside out, killing nearly everything. Our planet is fickle. When the unseen tug of celestial bodies points Earth toward a new north star, for instance, the shift in sunlight can dry up the Sahara or fill it with hippopotamuses. Of more immediate concern today, a variation in the composition of the Earth's atmosphere of as little as 0.1% has meant the difference between sweltering Arctic rainforest and a half mile of ice atop Boston, that negligible wisp of the air is carbon dioxide. Since about the time of the American Civil War, CO2's crucial role in warming the planet has been well understood. And not just based on mathematical models, the planet has run many experiments with different levels of atmospheric CO2. At some points in the Earth's history, lots of CO2 has vented from the crust and leaped from the seas, and the planet has gotten warm. At others, lots of CO2 has been hidden away in the rocks and in the ocean's depths, and the planet has gotten cold. The sea level, meanwhile, has tried to keep up, rising and falling over the ages, with coastlines racing out across the continental shelf, only to be drawn back in again. During the entire half-billion-year Phanerozoic eon of animal life, CO2 
<coughs> has been the primary driver of the Earth's climate. And sometimes when the planet has issued a truly titanic slug of CO2 into the atmosphere, things have gone horribly wrong. Today, humans are injecting CO2 into the atmosphere at one of the fastest rates ever over the entire near eternal span. <clears throat> when hucksters tell you that the climate is always changing, they're right. But that's not the good news they think it is. Quoting late Colombian climate scientist Wally Brecker, who I I had the honor of being the last person to ever interview Wally Brecker, and he died two weeks later. You can find that somewhere in Collapse Chronicles. What does Wally Brecker have to say about it? Quote, the climate system is an angry beast, and we are poking it with sticks. Close quote. The beast has only just begun to snarl. All of recorded human history at only a few thousand years, a mere eye blink in geologic time, has played out in perhaps the most stable climate window of the past 650,000 years. We have been shielded from the climate's violence by our short civilizational memory and our remarkably good fortune. But humanity's ongoing chemistry experiment on our planet could push the climate well beyond those slim historical parameters into a state it has not seen in tens of millions of years, a world for which Homo sapiens did not evolve. When there's been as much carbon dioxide in the air as there already is today, not to mention how much is likely to be in 50 or 100 years, the world has been much, much warmer with seas 70 feet higher than they are today. Why? The planet today is not yet in equilibrium with the warped atmosphere that industrial civilization has so recently created. If CO2 stays at its current levels, much less steadily increases, it will take centuries, even millennia, for the planet to fully find its new footing. The transition will be punishing in the near term and the long term, and when it's over, Earth will look far different from the one that nursed humanity. This is the grim lesson of paleoclimatology. The planet seems to respond far more aggressively to small provocations than it's been projected to by many of our models. To truly appreciate the coming changes to our planet, we need to plumb the history of climate change. So let us take a trip back into deep time, a journey that will begin with the familiar climate of recorded history and end in the feverish, high CO2 greenhouse of the early age of mammals 50 million years ago. It is a sobering journey, one that warns of catastrophic surprises that may be in store. There you go, and then uh, this dives into uh, this long, involved, pretty much book-length uh, book uh, article uh, we're going to stop here.
uh, and look at Sunday. They talk about, uh, you know, recent civilizations that have collapsed. Uh, by geologic standards, the climate has been remarkably stable ever since, meaning ever since the last ice age, until the sudden warming of the past few decades. That is unsettling because history tells us that even local, trivial climate misadventures during this otherwise peaceful span can help bring societies to ruin. In fact, 3,200 years ago, an entire network of civilizations, a veritable globalized economy, fell apart when minor climate chaos struck. Uh, then they quote a, a letter from ancient Syria. Uh, quote, there is famine in our house. We will all die of hunger. If you do not quickly arrive here, we ourselves will die of hunger. You will not see a living soul from your land. Across the Mediterranean and Mesopotamia, dynasties that had ruled for centuries were all collapsing. The mortuary temple walls of Ramses III, the last great pharaoh of Egypt's New Kingdom period, <clears throat> speak of waves of mass migration over land, over land and sea and warfare with mysterious invaders from afar. Within decades, the entire Bronze Age world had collapsed. Historians have advanced many culprits for the breakdown, including earthquakes and rebellions. But like our own teetering world, one strained by souring trade relations with fractious populaces led by unsteady, unscrupulous leaders, <clears throat> the Eastern Mediterranean and the Aegean were ill-prepared to accommodate the deteriorating climate. While one must resist environmental determinism, yes, while one must resist environmental determinism, it is nevertheless telling that when the region mildly cooled and a centuries-long drought st struck around 1200 BC, this network of ancient civilizations fell to pieces. Even Megiddo, the biblical site of Armageddon, was destroyed. Yes, the same story is told elsewhere over and over throughout the extremely mild stretch of time that is written history. Uh, and he, he uh, plays around with that more, talking about just how civilizations and the recent past have collapsed because of, you know, minor changes in the climate. Uh, which we're just beginning to see a repeat of. And then he goes deeper and deeper and deeper back through time. Uh, this is really a good uh, climate change 101 for anybody trying to. It's very well written. Uh, humans now threaten to undo the entire climate evolution of the Cenozoic era and in only a few decades. We have no modern analog for a swampy rainforest teeming with reptiles that nevertheless endure, endures months of Arctic twilight and polar night. But for each degree Celsius the planet warms, the atmosphere holds about 6% more water vapor. And given that global temperatures at the beginning of the age of mammals were roughly 13 degrees warmer than today, 
it's difficult to imagine how uncomfortable this planet would be for Ice Age creatures like ourselves. In fact, much of the planet would be rendered off limits to us, far too hot and humid for physiology. And then he continues to, uh, to go deeper and deeper through history. This ancient planet is far more extreme than anything being predicted for the end of this century by the United Nations or anyone else. After all, the world that hosted the rainforest on Ellesmere Island in Canada was 13 degrees Celsius warmer than our own, while the current global ambition enshrined in the Paris Agreement is to limit warming to less than two, or even one and a half degrees. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Part of what explains this glaring disparity is that most climate projections end at the end of this century feedbacks that might get you to Eocene or Miocene level warmth play out over much longer time scales than a century, but the other much scarier insight that Earth's history is very starkly, starkly telling us is that we have been missing something crucial in the models that we use to predict the future. Yes, but some of the models are starting to catch up. In 2019, one of the most computationally demanding climate models ever run by researchers at the California Institute of Technology simulated global temperatures suddenly leaping 12 degrees Celsius by the next century if atmospheric CO2 reaches 1,200 parts per million, a very bad but not impossible emissions pathway. And later that year, scientists from the University of Michigan and the University of Arizona were similarly able to reproduce the warmth of the Eocene by using a more sophisticated model of how water behaves at the smallest scales. And then he breaks all of this down. Uh, and this is, you have to go on and read this for yourself. Uh, the good news is the inertia of the Earth's climate system is such that we still, that we still have time to rapidly reverse course. Yes, uh-huh, the good news, uh, is that we still have time to rapidly reverse course, heading off an encore of this world or that of the Miocene or even the Pliocene in the coming decades. All it will require, all it will require is instantaneously halting the super eruption of CO2 disgorged into the atmosphere that began with the Industrial Revolution. We know how to do this, and we cannot underplay the urgency. The fact is that none of these ancient periods is actually an apt analog for the future if things go wrong. It took millions of years to produce the climates of the Miocene or the Eocene, and the rate of change right now is almost unprecedented in the history of animal life. Humans are currently injecting CO2 into the air 10 times faster than even during the most extreme periods with the, within the age of mammals, and you don't need the planet to get as hot as it was in the early Eocene to catastrophically acidify the oceans. Acidification is all about the rate of CO2 emissions, and we are off the charts. Ocean acidification could reach the same level it did 
56 million years ago by later this century and then keep going. When he coined the term mass extinction in a 1963 paper, the American paleontologist Norman Newell posited that this was what happened when the environment changed faster than evolution could accommodate. Life has speed limits, and in fact, life today is still trying to catch up with the thaw out of the last ice age about 12,000 years ago. Meanwhile, our familiar seasons are growing ever more strange. Flycatchers arrive weeks after their caterpillar prey hatches. Orchids bloom when there are no bees willing to pollinate them. The early melting of sea ice has driven polar bears ashore, shifting their diet from seals to goose eggs. And that is after just one degree of warming. Subtropical life, like what you see out this window in southeast Florida, which is soon to be going underwater, subtropical life may have been happy in a warmer Eocene Arctic, but there is no reason to think such an intimately adapted ecosystem evolved on a greenhouse planet over millions of years could be established in a few centuries or millennia. Down, drown the Florida Everglades, that's where I am, is on the northern edge of the Florida Everglades. Drown the Florida Everglades and its crocodilians, such as the alligators that you can't see in front of this camera, and its crocodilians would not have an easy time moving north into their old Miocene stomping grounds in New Jersey, much less migrating all the way to the unspoiled Arctic bayous of if humans recreate the world of the Eocene they, meaning the alligators, will run into the levees and fortifications of drowning Florida exurbs. We are imposing a rate of change on this planet that has almost never happened before in geologic history while largely preventing life on Earth from adjusting to that change. Taking in the whole sweep of Earth's history, now we see how unnatural, nightmarish, and profound our current experiment on the planet really is. A small population of our particular species of primates has, in only a few decades, unlocked a massive reservoir of old carbon slumbering in the earth, gathering since the dawn of life, and set off on a global immolation of Earth's history to power the modern world. As a result, up to half of the tropical coral reefs on Earth have died, 10 trillion tons of ice have melted, the ocean has grown 30% more acidic, and global temperatures have spiked. If we keep going down this path for a geologic nanosecond longer, who knows what will happen? The next few fleeting moments are ours, but they will echo for hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. This is one of the most important times to be alive in the history of life. Amen, Brother Peter Brannan. Peter Brannan is a science writer. Uh, he is the author of The Ends of the World, Volcanic Apocalypses, Lethal Oceans, and Our Quest to Understand Earth's Past Mass Extinctions. But anyway, I need to wrap up. Uh, this Chronicle of the Collapse, 
here in this subtropical watery wonderland known as Fish Eating Creek soon to be going underwater. So this is what uh, the Arctic used to look like before the Ice Age and uh, will probably look like again and uh, you know that's not altogether a bad thing. ebbing and flowing but I have to ebb from the Everglades and head back to reality I suggest you get out there and enjoy your subtropical wonderlands while you still can bye guys